thank you. That's fine. Yeah, we need to get you a clapperboard or something like that, mate, so we can, uh, yeah, so when the, when the take is started. Actually, I've just had conf confirmation that when, um, it's now live streaming. Wonderful. Thanks ever so much, Gary, and let's kind of kick off accordingly. And welcome to everyone, uh, both members, officers, and anyone that might be kind of watching on the, the live stream. I uh, hope all are, are safe and well. Uh, obviously, today uh, is uh, what we call in the Rail North uh, Committee consultation book call because of the, the current situation with covid We've taken the collective decision not to have a formal meeting in person because of all the challenges that entails, but to, to have this meeting virtually, which obviously can help inform the work of our officers on the, the issues that they need to be doing on our behalf before uh, our next formal board and, and committee meetings in the coming months. Uh, obviously, if we work our way through the agenda, uh, we've got welcome and apologies. So, David, are we aware of any apologies that need to be tendered at this stage? We had apologies from Mayor Andy Burnham and uh, just wanted to highlight that uh, Councillor Trevor Ainsworth um, was the previous uh, representative for East Midlands. They're in the process of appointing new representative as uh, Councillor Ainsworth has moved on to uh, another portfolio, I understand. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, thanks ever so much for that, Dave. And yes, if we can record our thanks to Trevor for all his work over a number of years, because he has been a very active participant in the work of the of the committee. Are there any other apologies that we that anyone else wants to raise? I can't see any indications, so I shall take that that there aren't. Uh, second item, obviously, is declarations of interest, and that's just me to remind all members if there is anything they need to uh, inform us of as a de declaration, either now or anything that may crop up during debate and discussion that they feel the need to make a, a declaration, please don't hesitate to do so so we can record it accordingly. And again, I can't see any indications, so let's move on to uh, the third item, which is the part one minutes of our last meeting that we held virtually on the, the 25th of uh, March. I'm conscious because we're not a formal committee meeting, technically we won't be able to fully approve these uh, today. That will have to wait until we have uh, a full constituted in-person committee. But are we happy that that's an accurate record of everything that happened on the 25th of March that we can endorse accordingly and obviously recommend acceptance for uh, at the next formal meeting if we're agreeable to that? And again, I'm not seeing any indications of dissent, so I will take that as read. OK, let's move into uh, some of the detailed work then. The, the fourth item is um, the report titled Priorities for uh, Future Rail uh, Services. I think we're going to allow about half an hour to, to deal with this so we can get into the, the sort of nitty gritty of it. And I think Sal, Sal and Patel is going to be presenting this one for us. So Sal, over to yourself. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm not proposing to go through the whole paper. I mean, members will be very much aware um, about what this issue is about. So I'm just going to have a little run through and I'll allow as much time as possible for discussion afterwards. Um, so members will be very aware that the consultation was released on the 11th of June um, and it has been released individually by operators um, as well. Um, this really seeks to take advantage of um, the investment in infrastructure and rolling stock that's been made on the East Coast Main Line. Um, and in, in advance of the release of this consultation, um, we, TFN, um, held a member briefing as well. Uh, many of you uh, will have attended as well. Um, from my point of view and from TFN's point of view, we, we heard very much loud and clear the strength of feeling across members um, for the proposals um, and the impact this is really going to have on local connectivity, particularly in the northeast, um, as well as direct connectivity across the Pennines as well. Um, so from a TFM point of view, we absolutely feel your pain and we are listening as well. Um, what are we looking to do? So we will be providing um, a strong response back to the department on the proposals. Um, we will be working with um, affected areas to help shape um, a coordinated response, um, which we'll be putting back to the department as well as the operators. Um, We've also set up a collaboration as well with the DFT, um, and that's really to look at how services can be developed in the northeast um, and across the east side of um, the Pennines to improve connectivity that has been affected. Um, and we're also looking at a roadmap, really looking for the future um, with the industry, um, for what that future starts to look like, the steps to getting those services back, and also enhancing for a future NPR stay as well. Um, 
So I'd, I, I, for, firstly, I'd probably say um, I'd strongly recommend member areas respond to that consultation, uh, provide any representations for their individual region, regions, as well as obviously inputting into the strategic cons um, consultation response that we will put back. And I'll probably stop there as well um, and I'll open for any questions and comments. Um, so thank you. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much for that, uh, Sal. I know there'll be lots of contributions and I'm going to turn to Jamie first because Jamie's indicating. Thank you very much, Liam. Thanks, um, Sal. Well, I like LNER and I like more trains to London, but not at the expense of what's going to happen as a result of these proposals. Um, for the fact that this meeting, I think, is only scheduled for two hours, I'm not going to go through all of the services we're going to lose because it would take more than that. But there's an excellent response by Senra of the South East Northumberland Railway. Uh, we are pushing through an irrational decision based on a criteria being changed on the assumption that improvements in infrastructure are going to happen that haven't happened. That's going to lead to reduced connectivity, not only within our region, but across the whole of the north. And yet again, this is coming down to running an economy in a London centric way for connectivity to London, where we already have good connectivity to destroy connectivity across the north and between the northern cities. And I don't think I'm the only person who thinks they're living in a Kafka novel where we have this strange conflation of rules have led us to this situation that everybody thinks is a bad situation. And the role of politicians in these times is to clear these log jams and to say, look, the rules may have got us here, but the rules are wrong. They produced an unintended consequence. So I'd like to put forward a little proposal that the timetable changes are put on hold, that a task force set up by the DFT, but led by someone independent, that the task force examines the constraints, puts forward options to resolve them both short term and long term, works out the best optimum solution, not based on decisions made eight years ago, but on what will work now, and then puts forward a plan to introduce the timetable changes slowly aligned to growth in capacity. Excellent. Thanks for that, Jamie. I think that's a very, very practicable and, and suitable solution that I'm more than, than happy to, to support. And let's get the, the view of, of other members. And I know kind of Susan's indicating. So, Susan. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'd support that too, because I think we just need to understand more about what's driving this. Uh, I mean, since this paper came out, so it's come to light that, of course, um, Bradford is going to be affected by these proposals as well. And and going back to the franchising agreement that uh, Mayor Driscoll talked about, um, Bradford was promised about six, train, six trains a day, I believe, to London at one point. And now we're not actually getting there, but we're going backwards. <laughs> um, so I, I do believe there's some um, investments that are needed um, to make sure that those commitments can be kept with in the future. And are, are we aware of what those are and where they are in the DFT pipeline? Because obviously if we are, then we all need to get behind those to make sure they're completed so that Bradford, a city of 537,000 people, can be properly connected to the capital city. Um, I also think, of course, we shouldn't be talking here about a, is it a choice between east, west, north and south? You know, we've said before again and again that actually we need both to give us good economic sustainability in the future uh, and uh, it just highlights the reasons why we need that investment in northern powerhouse rail and in hs2 so i'd leave it at that thank you yeah no absolutely and agree with all of those points as well susan is, is anyone else want to come in on this because i certainly will do very shortly but dan i'll, I'll bring you in now Thank you. Uh, just very briefly to completely agree with what Susan said uh, and Jamie before, I think he's brought forward a really sort of sensible proposal and certainly I'd be very happy to support it. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Dan. Well, well I'll just sort of give my view from the west of the Pennines, if, if you like, on, on all of this as well. That I'm very conscious that you know, the East Coast mainline consultation does directly affect people in the north east of Yorkshire but actually it affects all of the north of England one of the things that we're bitterly disappointed uh, about here not just in Liverpool but actually everyone west of Manchester is losing our direct connection to Edinburgh we campaigned long and hard to actually have that connection to, to Scotland's capital 
and it's pretty galling to see that being taken away from us on the basis of a, what everyone said is a north-south choice trumping an east-west uh, choice. And the bit I find really frustrating with all of this as well is that we put a lot of effort in to challenging and changing the Treasury Green Book rules that for decades had skewed investment towards London and the South East. We've done all that heavy lifting to change what the, the manual is meant to say, yet when we feed all the information into the computer, the computer still says no. And my great frustration, and I'll put it as a suspicion here, is actually this isn't about connections from the north down to London. I'm very concerned that actually this is all about putting a little bit more capacity south of Peterborough to support commuting journeys into London. And that doesn't mean that's not a priority for that other part of the country. But actually, that shouldn't be seen as the priority when these decisions are being taken, when actually it is going to put us back. This ain't levelling up. It's levelling down at the end of the day. So I strongly support uh, what Jamie's uh, proposed, and I hope we can all agree that and move it forward. But I, I can see David is um, is indicating. So, David, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just a, a couple of things I can add in response, really. Um, I think uh, first thing just to, just to highlight is um, the East Coast mainline uh, proposals, I guess, are a, a kind of – a bit of a, a test for the for the white paper that came out recently in that um, uh, they need joining up with a with a single guiding mind. You see the different consultations from the uh, various operators, which we we'll try to summarise in in the paper. But it needs uh, uh, an overall guiding mind, and if we can provide some of that, that would be very very uh, beneficial. I think. Um, obviously, we don't have uh, the Renault partnership looks at the, the northern and the TPE aspects of this. The LNER element is very much a, uh, a, a central government DFT-led uh, operation. So I think one of the things we uh, we can do if members agree that the course of action set out is not waiting for the consultation, but to make this proposal straight away uh, to uh, to the department. I think from TFN's point of view, there are a lot of parallels here with the Manchester work, which we've also got on the agenda, and uh, clearly we've got a we've got a task force on that. We've got uh, we might not be yet quite where we uh, absolutely need to be on that, but we've got a mechanism for dealing with it. And I think uh, I think the proposal here um, sort of suggests that there should be something very similar. And I think there are a lot of parallels because uh, the Manchester work clearly involves uh, a roadmap on infrastructure, and I think it was touched on by a couple of members. But fundamentally, at the heart of this is um, there's a lack of uh, paths on the East Coast Main Line because of the infrastructure for all the services that are needed either now or, or in the future. So to answer the, the question from, uh, from what I've seen, uh, there are uh, plans uh, for the East Coast Main Line north of York that would deliver in the short term uh, additional paths that would allow these services to be uh, restored and expanded. Um, they're under development at the moment, but what they need is, is bringing to uh, a head with a clear, a clear roadmap and obviously clear, clear funding commitment uh, behind them as well. And that would be, I think, a core part of the, uh, uh, the work on the task force. I think specifically um, on Councillor Hinchcliffe's point, um, there are also some proposals around uh, facilitating that Bradford increase. Again, they're in the, uh, the rail network enhancements pipeline. They are under development, but again, um, they're, they're critical to understanding what the future is. So I think quite rightly we'd want to see um, uh, how those are going to be brought, brought forward. So I think, I think the proposal would allow all of those uh, things to be brought together. And TFN would be absolutely happy to support that in terms of providing uh, evidence uh, an analysis and, uh, uh, and all the work we've done on the new business cases and the new Green Brook approach that I think could really help in demonstrating how important that east-west connectivity is, uh, as well as the north-south connectivity. So, uh, yeah, happy to, uh, uh, to support uh, that uh, uh, from a technical point of view, from an officer point of view, and implement, uh, implement it if you, uh, if you agree it. Excellent. Thanks for that, David. I think that's all very helpful uh, suggestions to, to incorporate as well. Um, I'm not seeing any other indications, so I, I'm going to sort of propose that we accept uh, Jamie's uh, recommendation and, uh, and, and proposal there. And I'm not seeing any kind of dissent, so I'm going to take that as a unanimous uh, agreement uh, for that as a proposal and for that report accordingly. 
Okay, so if we want to, to move on then to item five, which is rail reform matters, and I think David, you're going to give us a, a brief update on this particular. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. So the white paper, as everybody will know, was published uh, at the end of May. Um, the TFN board did consider that in, in some detail in a paper on the 9th of June. So the report you've got here is committee because it's the first committee discussion since the paper was, was published, um, has uh, set out uh, the key elements of the white paper, but it's also incorporated the uh, discussion you had at the board mem meeting, or, or many of you did, and the actions that were proposed to be implemented after the board meeting. So the summary just really highlights how big a shake-up this is. I think it's important to underline that. It's the biggest change in 25 years since privatisation and franchising was started. Obviously, it sweeps away the franchises, brings together track and train into a new guiding mind, Great British Railway. So TFN um, has welcomed many aspects of it because, um, you know, it actually delivers many of the things we've been calling for since the uh, – problems with the May 18 uh, disastrous timetable implementation and uh, some of the issues that came to light there in terms of the fragmentation and lack of joining up between track and train and, and lack of a guiding mind to make that call on uh, on timetable changes. So there's, there's many things in it that um, we can and have welcomed. Um, the board obviously discussed um, the risks and opportunities really for us as well. And I think on the risks side, just to highlight our role and your role as, as committee and the Rail North Partnership is not clearly defined at this stage. Um, uh, so in particular, it doesn't mention the role of strategic transport bodies um, such as uh, TFN uh, specifically. And the accountability, of course, in the white paper sits with the new organisation, Great British Railways, where obviously what we have been seeking through uh, things like the Blake Jones Review is much more local accountability. And the other side of it is the, uh, the new organisation will be built on the existing network rail regions. And as we've had a long-standing view that those uh, two regions uh, across the north don't necessarily uh, fit or serve our geography that well. So that sort of perpetuates that. Although there is reference to uh, perhaps post-Northern Powerhouse Rail uh, that could be looked at, but I think it's something that we would want to see revisited uh, much earlier so we have an actual uh, clear interface with the new body uh, that works across the whole of the north. I think the opportunities uh, are really around us building on the partnership we had. So there's Appendix 2 that's attached, which uh, uh, wasn't with the board report, but is uh, more information, really. It's our initial response to the Secretary of State on the uh, on the white paper and it's really setting out what we can offer as TFN and TFN members uh, in terms of building that stronger partnership and making sure that it delivers as I think is the intention of the white paper the local communities right across the north so we set out our our, our capability in that letter you know planning at a, a pan-northern level focus on east-west which we've just been talking about in terms of the east coast mainline consultation but also NTR obviously focuses on that east-west connectivity and really what we can bring to bear in terms of evidence analysis and, and local needs which is I, I guess what this committee and members of the committee are all about putting local needs and passengers first so we really emphasize that as well as some of the good work we have done uh, the statements and, and achievements we made on the back of the, the May 18 problems uh, very clear decisive action we took and you took and the local collaboration we've done on the back of COVID work as well I think we're all real strengths that we hope will be uh, heard and built on. So we set out our response. We've had some positive responses back from the department yet. Um, we haven't yet seen the programme for development of the new organisation and how that's going to be constructed. But what we are saying is we want to actually be part of that and part of the, uh, the industry bodies that, uh, that work to, to deliver that. So we've set out in Section 4 the actions that were agreed by the board, including a role in, in setting up the new organisation, and uh, also highlighting the point that was made at the board about there's some opportunities here in the north for early devolution stations being one of those that was specifically mentioned at the at the board meeting, which uh, we will pursue on, on your behalf as well. So the, the, uh, the paper asked, uh, asked the committee to note uh, the progress we're making um, and that we are going to seek clarity and continue to seek clarity on our, our future role, how we can build on it. 
and also for the committee to note that we are about to commission some detailed work, some evidence-based work on the case for change, what the new structure and organisation could look like in the North that would really draw in the best of the, the white paper proposals and the best of, of what the North can, can bring through yourselves and your authorities as well. So that work is about to kick off. We'll bring that back to uh, committee in outline terms and the idea is that we will uh, bring back uh, a full proposal to the TFN board when it meets at the end of September. So that's all I wanted to say, uh, Chair, and obviously happy for questions, comments. Yeah, thanks ever so much for that, uh, David. I've got Andy and Susan. So, Andy, do you want to come in first? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Liam, <coughs> and thanks, David. Morning, everybody. Um, I think this is tremendously important, uh, David. Um, I think we've got to quickly articulate what a new sort of governance sort of political architecture looks like for rail in the north of England and not wait <coughs> for it to be done uh, to us. I'm, I'm encouraged, obviously, by a lot of what's in the white paper, the way Keith Williams was talking at NTAC the other day, but I, I still think there's a, ten a tension here that we've got to be honest about where, you know, at national level, I'm not sure, you know, TFN is as supported as we would want it to be, if I could put it that way. But I'm, I'm absolutely determined to keep TFN um, in one form or another, uh, Liam, for the reasons you were giving when I joined the call, which is left to its own devices, the rail industry focus drifts away from the north of England. I mean, that's just basically what happens time and time again. So we could say, you know, we could hold up May 2018 as a, as a prime example of that. But actually, you can go, you know, the, the failure to sort infrastructure over a long period of time is an example of that. The failed consultation on the recent timetable options is another example of that. That just focus isn't here. And consequently, they keep coming up with half solutions uh, to us. So I don't think we can accept a national guiding mind in which there is no clear voice for the north of England, because that is dangerous for us. You know, the, um, the, the history tells us that we will get neglected in that arrangement so <clears throat> i think this is becoming clear to me how we how we, i am becoming clear i think how i feel we should uh to develop this but obviously i put it out there just to see whether other board members feel feel the same so the new geography david has got to to be based on combined authorities first and foremost in the network rails regions don't make any sense to anybody other than network rail and they've got to go because if railways are going to become more focused on place and the wider agenda that's going on in places through through devolution, then it's got to kind of understand that the the first building blocks of this are city region economies, aren't they? Basically, and that map is growing with West Yorkshire now fully you know, fully coming through, and hopefully you know, more and more places in the in the north will get will get the same. You know, we will be the entities hopefully that will take on the stations firstly but then have a role with regard to services. And therefore, you know, we, we, we are a kind of a, you know, a, a part, we have to be that sort of, um, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, working with the, the guiding mind, if you like, or tasked by the guiding mind, or held to account by the guiding mind, whatever, however that gets constructed. So that, I think, is part of the architecture. But then I would want to see a strong TFN over the top of that, knitting us all together. And, you know, making sure that we're working together, resolving disputes, but possibly between us, that that might happen from time to time when we move you know, more towards a, a city region focus. So TFN becomes the arbiter of the whole of the jigsaw of the North, as well as being the voice of the North back to the national guiding guiding mind. And I'm probably not, you know, I'm encouraged to see a few nods as I'm speaking. I mean, I'm not saying I've got this perfectly right, Liam, but for me, it feels something like it feels something like like that. Um, you know, it, it, in many ways, you know, TFN becomes the, you know, the, the bit that the national guiding mind has to go to before it, you know, before it makes any decision. You know, I, you can see how this might, might, might work. So that, that's where I think we should quickly develop our proposals and not wait, actually, get them all, get them developed and then all of us coalesce around them um, so that we're not done to later in the year. I hope that, hope that makes sense. Thanks, Jack. Certainly does, Andy, and I think kind of that articulates what most of us are strongly feeling in all of this. Um, Susan, do you want to come in? Yes, I was going to say similar, really. Then that CFN is now a, a mature, quite a mature organisation. How long have we been going now for a number of years? And therefore, 
we should really be in a position to be able to say how this can work for all of the North uh, and put our own proposals together and not wait for something to come out of government and then provide a reaction to that. You know, we should be mature enough to work with government to say, look, we think this is how it could work. I think there's also probably something for TFN to do in terms of um, making sure, talking to Midlands Engine and all those other regional bodies to make sure that the model you're coming up with works for other parts of the country as well. Um, and then, you know, we can go with a, a proposal to government, which actually they can just plug and play um, all across the nation. And, and I think, again, that shows the maturity of our organisation that we're able to do that. So I'd welcome speedy work on this. Uh, to make sure that, you know, TFN, this is, if we didn't have TFN, we'd have to invent it now, wouldn't we? <laughs> so this is when you come into your own, uh, and therefore let's let's show that we can step up to it and take responsibility and initiative. Brilliant, thanks for that, Susan. Uh, Jamie. Thanks, Liam. Just to echo Andy's points, that national guiding mind has given us... Um, HS2, starting at London, working north, when everybody knows the business case, if it had started in Edinburgh and worked south, it would have been better for the entire country, but that's not the way it happened. And we have an East Coast main line that's got capacity constraints, such that our early discussion shows that if we want an extra train to London, it means we can't get trains to Liverpool and Manchester. It's crazy. So the only way that's going to change is if we have a strong voice for the north with the analytical capacity to back it up. Because it's no good just us shouting, we want more services to the north, if we can't produce the detailed proposals that would do it. So, yes, absolutely do that. And, uh, and of course, it should be on the city region basis. Brilliant. Thanks for that, um, Jamie. Do, Tim, do you want to come in and then I'll, I'll say a few words myself? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Chair. So we do have the analytical, analytical capacity. Uh, we also have the interactive train service plans uh, working right the way through for the north of England over the next few years. The big issue ultimately for me is that HS2 is gobbling our cash up. Um, we don't know what the end state number is going to be, but very clearly we are the shock absorber up here in the north. And the quicker the government publish the integrated rail plan, the quicker we will understand uh, whether or not they've gone with the members' preferred network. That is for NPR. In terms of moving train paths around at the moment, well, clearly the government feel that the LNER service, the additional one, would be a higher revenue than uh, what we have currently at the moment, which is uh, cutting out the TPE service going across the north of England, east to west. That is absolutely not correct. What we should be doing is totally supporting continuing on with that TPE service. That is absolutely key for that connectivity all the way up through the northeast uh, from the west. So we continue to push really hard to get that integrated rail plan out, because until we have that, we do not understand where the government is going. We cannot glue the integration piece together and therefore the timetables together. And we have a series of priorities that need to be sorted out. So that's where we are currently at the moment, Liam. We have all the tools in the box. Uh, we have your support, and that's really helpful. Uh, and uh, we continue to push uh, uh, government, not in a lobbying way, uh, but just push government uh, to get that IRP out. We do not see the vision of the government otherwise. And therefore, I would not advocate that May 22 timetable change for the LNER, LNER service to appear. Uh, we've done the same process with uh, the other service changes that they wanted through Manchester, uh, and we've now, uh, through your help, uh, managed to move that to December currently at the moment. Uh, but I would not advocate any timetable changes until we are very, very clear as to what all the moving parts mean. Thank you, Chair. Th thanks, Tim. I think that nicely kind of deals with what we were dealing with previously on the East Coast main line as well. But I've seen Susan's hand's gone up. I assume it's in relation to something Tim's just said. So do you want to, to come in, Susan? So I, I can't get any, let any reference of the IRP go past without mentioning it at the moment, of course, because uh, there is concern about what's going to be in the IRP, uh, particularly from a Bradford point of view with press that's come out over the weekend of the Sunday Express. Um, so um, just you know, I'm grateful for TFN support that obviously TFN board have been quite clear that having a new line complete between Manchester 
Bradford Central and Leeds is the preferred and desired route. And I, I know everybody's backing that, so thank you for that. Um, we do press, continue to press government to release that so we can fully know their intent and, and see that hopefully they agree with the northern uh, constituencies and northern leaders that that is the right thing to do for the whole of the north. So sorry, um, Liam, I couldn't let that to reference go past. Um, so apologies for just uh, disrupting your agenda there. Thank you. Not a problem in the slightest, uh, Susan. I'm happy to kind of give our 100% sororial support to everything you've said there, but you would also expect me to, to equally uh, sort of recognise that we've got the full board support for a brand new line between Liverpool and Manchester as well. Actually, we need brand new infrastructure going all the way from Liverpool all the way across to, to Leeds as part of this. And woe betide any government that comes back with an IRP that doesn't reflect that transformational infrastructure that we need to see across the whole of the north so more than happy to kind of echo and em amplify everything you've just said there i think in terms of just getting back to the rail reform uh, matters just to sort of tie this uh, report up i agree with everything that has been, been said i think it's really important as andy said that we move at real pace here because if we're not careful we will be done to rather than being at the forefront of um, the reforms. And whilst there are some good things in there, you know, I welcome a, a national guide in mind. I think if we'd had a national guide in mind, we probably wouldn't have had the disaster we had in, in May 18, uh, for example. I do think it's absolutely vital that that national guide in mind shouldn't be based in London. I think there's a very strong argument that GB Railways should be based in the north of England uh, as part of a kind of inward investment uh, proposition for one of the towns and cities up here. But one of my great concerns, echoing everything that others have said, is that it's not clear where devolution fits within uh, the white paper. Yes, there are you know, acknowledgements about the devolved settlements in Merseyside and in Tyne and Weir, and that's good. But I think all of us across the north want to go further with all of that. Actually, um, I think we'd all agree that having what is currently now Northern and Trans Pennine Express effectively being run from London would be completely and utterly unacceptable. And by the same token, something that is based on Network Rail's existing geography of um, arterial routes emanating in and out of London inevitably will mean that kind of it's that uh, traffic, both passenger and freight at the southern end of the route, that will get undue attention over and above actually what's more important when you look at rail movements in the north of England about the things within our region, particularly those east-west movements. So I strongly believe that, that the geography needs to be changed within all of this. But equally, as, as Andy said, actually there needs to be that kind of provision for double devolution in all of this, where kind of each of the localities of the north, particularly the combined authority city regions, but also those county areas, can take a much greater involvement, influence and control of some of the kind of locally important services uh, to their areas. So all of that needs to be kind of uh, within our response and that engagement with government needs to kind of happen quickly. The other point I'd also make, because this is uh, something that I care very passionately about, is that there is an underlying uh, issue with the, um, the white paper about driving costs out of the industry. And I think we all want the industry to be more efficient and more effective. We wouldn't argue against that. But I get deeply disappointed when the rolling stock leasing companies are effectively being left untouched uh, within all of this. It's something that I care passionately about because when we've bought brand new trains over here in the Liverpool city region, we've gone nowhere near the privatised leasing companies because I call them the, the loan sharks of the industry. I don't mean that offensively. I mean that exactingly. It's a really expensive way of providing brand new trains that actually that should be challenged and done completely differently. So I think part of our work needs to... Uh, show that because it's something that we've done differently in the Liverpool city region. I know Jamie's team up in the North East are doing something similar. And there's a great example of how the North can actually give a solution to the whole of the country that uses public money much better than it has been done for 30 years in the, in the provision of trains. So I, I would kind of put all those points on the table, but I know Andy wants to come back in as well. Sorry, Liam, I really don't want to prolong it, but it, it was just something you said, and I, I think it's really just important to make this point before we leave this discussion. I don't want what I said to think, look like it's all about you know, mayoral combined authorities and, we're the, you know, and it's all about a thing that works for us. I think it's really important to say that TFN is critical in a world where other parts of the North don't yet have devolution. And TFN, I think, is critical to act for those areas in advance of the devolution map being, you know, being completed. Um, and you know, I think 
this has got to work for everybody. I think it would be a very dangerous world for those areas if, if, if our role as mayoral combined authorities was recognised by the national guide, guiding mind, but the areas out neighbouring to us that don't have a mayoral combined authority devolution, you know, it would be a very risky place for, that, for them to find themselves if, if there was no TFN. So I just think it's really important, obviously, to say that this is in the interest of everywhere in the north, and we all agree this, you know, whether we're in a mayoral combined authority or we're not in a mayoral combined authority, we all have uh, you know, a, a belief that we both have to have that deep devolution, but with that TFN uh, umbrella, if you like, protecting all of us. So I just thought it's just worth, you, you kind of touched on it, you know, the county areas, I just thought it was worth making that, worth making that point. But no, it's a really good discussion, I think we're all in the same place, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah, no, thanks ever so much for that, Andy. Okay, so I think that's very clear, uh, David and Martin and Tim and the team, um, where we need to crack on with that very quickly, and we look forward to that work coming back to us accordingly. Okay, yeah, if so we move on to... Oh, sorry, David. No, just, was... just, just agreeing, uh, Chair, we, we will move that on uh, very, very quickly. I think we know uh, we've done a lot of work on what that model is. We can articulate that very quickly. And then we'll bring the evidence alongside that and the case for change as well. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much. OK, let's move on to item six, which is the Rail North Partnership update. Uh, report that encompasses a number of different things. I know we've got three people that are going to speak. So we've got Gary Bogan first, uh, who's one of the Rail North Partnership directors, who's going to introduce the report. And I know we've also got Rob and Caroline from uh, Northern, who are going to give a brief update on some Northern issues. And also, as well, um, we've got Matthew Galton, the new Managing Director of Transparent Express, who will briefly touch on TP's Direct Award. So, Gary, do you want to, to go first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, happy, Liam. Um, you imagine coming from a place where I, too, am really interested to know um, where these two uh, real contractors will be managed from in the future. Um, and so, um, likewise, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be interested to see how that, how that plays out. Um, in, in terms of what the partnership and the, and the talks have been have been looking to do this this last period, um, I, I won't repeat what's in the report, but maybe um, worth pulling out that some of the big areas that have absorbed a lot of energy are indeed um, Manchester Recovery Task Force and East Coast Main Line as we look to um, finalise what the propositions are there in order to get um, people um, able to, to give their final comments. Um, also worth noting that I think since we last met, um, work has started in earnest trackside and the Transpennine route upgrade, and so we're starting to um, have to work with the, the operators to make sure that um, they have everything that they need um, to enable them to keep passengers moving during that. Um, there's some material in the uh, in, in the paper on the fleet availability issues that that, um, that surfaced here in the north are akin to what you were seeing um, experiencing in the southwest. Um, really noteworthy that particularly with respect to Northern, um, they have been able with their suppliers to get on top of that really very quickly so that, um, and, and Rob can explain more if needs be, but uh, that, that, that issue feels well in hand. Um, and similarly, uh, TP, I know, have worked through the first group and beyond to ensure that they have their, their, their kind of um, watching brief around that issue for them, that, that they're going to need to keep the, keep the Novas moving. Um, this is now the beginning of business planning review cycle. We've got a first quarterly review of the new form business plans going on, um, and that will include work that will lead to the replacement of the service agreement that we have just now with Northern by March of, of next year. Um, and also, um, and you'll hear from, from Matthew later on the, um, the commencement of the TPE DA, which uh, we'll, we'll see quite a lot of early product delivered that helps us to, to shape out the future of the, of the operation there. Um, and also the comprehensive spending review is, is now um, beginning for us. Uh, that's what will set our budget for the next three years and where we'll look to capture working with yourselves, what the um, aspirations likewise are of the operators and for the operations in the, in the north so that we can look to secure that um, from Treasury in, in, in due course. Um, the, um, the other area that we're, we're now um, looking to kick off in, in, in some in some force, as it were, is the beginning of the, the transformation of the two operators that we'll need to see to enable them to become um, carbon uh, or, or, or to move across uh, from reliance on diesel um, and, and decarbonise the, um, the, the network in the industry in the north if we're to meet what for us is a, a very challenging timetable. And that alongside 
other initiatives on on the network that are intended to make it work more efficiently, like uh, uh, basically electronic signalling in cab, um, will mean that we've got a, a lot to do in terms of making the case and the argument for uh, new rolling stock fleets or improvements, certainly in the fleets that we have. And so that, again, will bring to, y to yourselves in due course, but uh, that's really quite exciting because that will um, that would see the completion really of the transformation that we started with in the in the two um, franchises back in 2016, albeit not inside those franchises, um, but um, uh, through close working with both the operators and, and the industry, I have to say that we're starting to see quite a lot of the type of interworking that um, the guiding mind calls for and that the GB uh, R would look for. And so I actually think there's the opportunity for us to be quite innovative in that space in the north because of the close connection between our two operators and the in the two network regions. Um, but in the short run for us, and I, I know that Rob and Carolyn come to speak, Carolyn will come to speak about that, um, all of the focus is on the fact that we're seeing a strong demand return in the north, um, in respect of northern, certainly well ahead of other um, a, a commuter railways across parts of the rest of the UK, which obviously brings with it issues whilst it's welcome in terms of patronage and revenue and um, it also brings the issues of how we operate then in in with rising demand levels at the same time as we still have expectations and requirements around about social distancing um, and how we use to support the reopening of the economy at the same time as we keep the uh, keep the passengers comfortable that what we're providing them is what they would expect in the, at the hopefully tail end of these COVID times so that's been um, a, a great deal of the focus I know for, for the operational railway in that in the last uh, three months or so. Um, I won't say much more about that, I think, because I'm not the expert. I'd probably, Liam, if you're happy, um, would invite Rob and Carolyn perhaps to come in at this point, and, and then uh, Matthew likewise afterwards to to, to give us some uh, material on the PPE um, DA and the, and the exciting stuff that's that's happening there. I don't know if anyone has any questions in the meantime on, on my element, and if not, I'll, I'll probably hand over to Rob. Brilliant. Thanks, Gary. I think it's probably best if we have all the kind of um the kind of contributions at this stage and then we, we bring the sort of questions uh, in so R rob do you want to do your bit um, on northern and then if you can do his bit on tp and then we can have you know questions and comments thank you um chair so i think gary's said most of uh, what the highlights were in the, in, in, <laughs> in the last month so 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 so, so thank you gary um the, the new timetable um obviously came in in, in may um and has settled down um quite quite nicely we, we did have um, quite a difficult first week or so because we, as you know, we've got about 25 of our brand new trains were, were laid up with the your damper issues. Um, pleasingly, we've now got 24 out of those 25 trains back in service. So we do have the, the, the full rolling stock fleet available to operate um, the main um, timetable. So as, as Gary said, seen some significant increases in, in passenger numbers. Uh, particularly over the um, May Bank holiday week, which goes to show that there is a strong demand for, for, for leisure travel. And we've seen that, that strong demand um, fall off a little bit, but still stay strong. Um, we're not really quite seeing the, the, the morning peak commute coming back strongly, but with people being asked to continue to work from home, that, that, that is understandable. But we will be certainly looking forward to, to trying to understand where the market is likely to go. Um, if, if, if possibly our market migrates more to be in later in the day, we, we always used to used to have the key focus between eight and nine o'clock in the morning, moving all those hundreds of thousands of people every year. Um, we, that isn't quite the focus at the moment. It's later in the afternoon where we see the bigger passenger numbers. So, so it would be um, quite, quite important that we keep close to how we possibly have to change where our capacity delivery um, is, is focused in, in, in the future. Um, as as Gary said, we are starting to look. Um, we've got a, a team of people looking now at, um, at the rolling stock strategy for, for Northern, considering the significant decarbonisation agenda that, that we, we face. Um, the, the vast majority of our fleet will be approaching 35 to 40 years old by the time we get to, to the middle part of this, this decade. So how do we replace that? in a railway that doesn't have that many wires above it. Only 25% of our network is electrified. Um, so to, 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 be, to, to move away from diesel is going to be um, quite a challenge. And hence, we're still developing um, uh, 
quite innovative ideas around hydrogen and, and battery and working with Network Rail to optimise poten a potential rolling programme of, of, of electrification. Just, just looking forward, we've been working with Officer Reference Group for December timetable. We will, we will be looking at changing services in December to, to, to balance the, the demand with the resource constraints we still have. We've still got quite a lot of, of drivers to, to train to get us back to um, where we, we need to be. And so we will we'll be, be bidding for the December timetable shortly um, and working with some feedback from, from your officers. I'll, I'll leave it there for any questions. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, Matthew, do you want to go next? And then we'll, we'll take all the, the questions and comments collectively. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so good morning. Uh, I'm Matthew Dalton, the new uh, MD at TPE. Uh, delighted to join you. Uh, clearly, your committee's got a, a key role in the oversight and development of railways in the north of England, and I look forward to working with you really, really closely. Um, so as Gary said, we have a new national rail contract uh, for TPE that started uh, on the 30th of May, uh, which it was my privilege to uh, lead our negotiations with the DFT and Rail North Partnership for. Um, uh, it's, it's an important contract in the sense that it, it, it really does give us uh, a renewed focus uh, about how we serve you. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about performance first. I think it's uh, been a, a key topic uh, over recent years. I'm pleased that TPE's performance uh, is, is steadily improving. Uh, the last uh, four-week uh, reporting period, which ends this Sunday, uh, indeed, we're, we're at 94.8%. We're just tucked in behind Mersey Rail and London Overground, which is a good place to be in building on a, a plus 94% uh, score in the previous period. Uh, in this new contract, uh, we've got a new focus on performance, new measures, uh, particularly measuring on-time calls at every station, not just the end destination, uh, set around being on time or within three minutes of the scheduled arrival time at every station uh, we call at. So that's, uh, that's where our focus is shifting to. Uh, and if we don't meet, meet those targets, I'm going to be open and transparent with you as to why we aren't getting there. Uh, but we've started very well. So the new contract uh, is an exciting opportunity to, to build a stronger, more customer responsive railway uh, for the north of England and Scotland. Uh, one of the focuses uh, building on work that TFN and yourselves have been doing is going to be looking at uh, how we improve connectivity across the north of England and into Scotland uh, to make sure that we're playing our part uh, as part of that uh, pandemic uh, post-pandemic recovery uh, and critically uh, getting the investment sort of investment that we need uh, into the North of England's railways. So one thing that we have started as part of our new contract uh, is looking at how we expand TP's network uh, of intercity and interurban services. We're going to be doing uh, a piece of work with stakeholders this summer on that. Uh, we're really looking to see how we can uh, improve uh, the uh, number of folk that we're serving uh, and the frequency by which we serve them. Uh, it's a really, really important part of keeping the railway relevant and wanted. Uh, my background uh, before I joined uh, TP was predominantly with Great Western Railway. Um, and what we found there is we get a coalition of the willing together, making the right arguments with sound business cases, um, which I did personally in Devon and Cornwall, then we can get serious amounts of money uh, into the railway. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to shouldering arms with you uh, under this new contract uh, and my personal involvement with that uh, in getting that coalition of the willing together uh, and really driving forward and getting the, the sorts of investment uh, that we need in the north for a continually growing railway. My, my personal commitment to you is that we'll be an even stronger, TP will be an even stronger partner for you than it's been before. Uh, and that we will work really, really hard with you uh, on shared aspirations. So uh, I hope that's a, a helpful introduction to, to me uh, and to the new contract uh, and my personal philosophy, and indeed, that of my senior team, and that's what we're going to do working with you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Matthew, and I think we're all really looking forward to, to working with you in the months and years ahead. Dan, you're indicating, so over, over to you. Thanks very much, Liam, and thanks to everybody for those reports. My question is is for Gary. Uh, Gary, I note that we've been provided with updates for all of the operators except East Midlands Railways, um, although obviously I appreciate that Rail North doesn't have the same 
contractual relationship with East Midlands as they do with Northern and TPE. As you know, there is an overlap, as you briefly touched on in your report, with the issues that they're having with rolling stock. However, I understand that East Midland Railway's problems extend beyond rolling stock, and we were informed last week that these issues extend to complex operational issues, high levels of staff sickness, and strike action on Sundays, which look to continue until the end of August. The overall impact of this will be that from last Sunday, East Midlands Rail Railways have reduced the timetable they introduced back in May to 75% of the total services. And this looks as if it will continue uh, until December. So can I ask um, that where there are direct implications and impact on other operators, such as the delayed rolling stock being cascaded to Northern, can I ask you what's being done by Rail North and TFN to work with and engage with East Midlands R Railways to resolve these issues? And who's responsible for pushing for timescales for these issues to be resolved? Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Dan. Gary? Yeah, so our, our, um, we work uh, closely with the what I would be known as and say the department is a market lead and there, there is a market lead for East and West Midlands who is a member of the Rail North Partnership Board as a Department for Transport uh, representative. Um, so we have been working uh, closely with him, particularly in respect of the, the cascade to Northern because it, it's actually a two-stage cascade. It's West Midlands to East, then East Midlands on to Northern. Um, and, and looking at um, how quickly those issues are likely to resolve themselves. Um, it, it, and I know, Rob, that, that you have you have spoken likewise with East and, and West Midlands on this. Um, it's difficult. Uh, the, the cascade element is really difficult. I think that we are going to need to look at, at all of the options there. At the moment, we've got um, derogations available for rolling stock, which otherwise should be retired if it's not going to be um, fitted for um, accessibility. Um, and I, I understand actually accessibility issues aren't huge, but they're quite difficult to overcome. Um, and so we do speak very closely to um, to that market lead to the East Coast, and uh, uh, this, uh, East Midlands and West Midlands um, talks. Uh, and, and I can look, Dan, to, to, to pull out the dates and times that we do have. Um, but I, I think it's fair to say, Rob, we don't have anything um, cast iron as yet that we're still looking at. Um, the dealing with rather than the getting past um, in, in respect of the cascade issue. Correct, Gary. We don't we don't have any definitive dates, and we're now looking at potential mitigations to put in place at the end of this year to to to, to keep going because the one five threes at the moment only have derogation in, until December. Okay, thanks for that, Sam. Gents, Susan. Thank you. I mean, I suppose I'm just contemplating really the last year or even two has changed uh, everything, hasn't it? And and in your businesses, that will have had a major impact on how you operate and how you think about investing. And I, I just obviously we've talked about there's business planning in the paper and and it is important that we at TFN are really involved in that and cited on what's happening with that, because is that going to change as the last, well, 18 months, I suppose, changed your um, short-term, medium-term, long-term business planning? Have, have you, are you not going to invest as much? Um, and I suppose the second part of it, really, is we started this meeting by talking about changes in services which were promised to us by operators and now are not going to be delivered. And therefore, we need to be cited early on, really, in the business planning, if that's going to impact on services and whether we need to lobby, therefore, to get investment into track changes, etc., so you can deliver the, the agreements that you're proposing. So I suppose it's a plea, really, to make sure that business planning is open and transparent and also you let us know now if there's things that you think that you were proposing before the pandemic, which you're now not going to be able to do. I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, uh, Susan. One of the things I was going to ask is exactly on that kind of aspect about how will the business planning process effectively report into the committee to, to seek our endorsement and each of the kind of stages as it, as it goes along. Um, I can see Matthew's indicating, so Matthew, do you want to come back first? But I'm, I'm sure in a wider sense, Gary and, and David will probably want response uh, respond as well. Lou? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yep. Sorry. Yeah. Two, two buttons to press. Apologies for that. So I don't think uh, Council is, is, is at all wrong in asking a question about uh, how we're responding to the pandemic. 
Um, I think it's our responsibility as the rail industry to take a long term view, uh, irrespective of contract length and so on. I think that that's healthy. Uh, I've worked with Rob for, for over 10 years in various guises. I know he takes, takes that view as well. Um, uh, and that's what we need to do. But critically, you know, it is it, it's a fundamental tenant for me that what we do has to be rooted in the needs of the communities that we serve. Um, so um, as I as I said earlier in meetings, certainly TPE, our, our, our philosophy now is and, and our action is to is to look for a long term plan uh, in terms of what's appropriate. Um, but that that needs to be informed by your needs. And then in turn, we make that. We make we articulate those arguments to, to those who uh, have a have a bearing on the amount of money that we can spend and bring to bear. I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Matthew. D David, are you coming back as well? Yeah, really, just to reassure the committee, we have agreed uh, on the business planning process that uh, this new process under the new contracts we will have input. You will have input at three stages. The first of that would be sort of initial ideas and, and uh, things you'd like to see. We'll gather that over the next uh, couple of months uh, before that's fed in more formally through Gary. And then I think there is, uh, as a reminder, there's a sort of final stage where we work with DFT on, on the budget available and the priorities that we would need to uh, need to agree based on the budget before the, uh, before the uh, uh, business plan comes into play at the start of the next financial year. So yes, you should be seeing much more involvement on that going forward. The, the other point is, um, I think, in terms of there's much less of things being done to us now because we're not on a, as we move out of franchises. There's a real opportunity, and we've been talking to uh, Rob and colleagues and uh, also Matthew about things we can do uh, with the operators to develop services and actually to, you know, realign resources, as Rob mentioned. So I think we'll have some really interesting uh, discussions, starting with, with, with your lead officers, uh, but also then with you as committee members over the next few months about reshaping things. Um, and this is about actually getting more out of the money and subsidies going into the north and delivering more for you and communities, whether that's tackling leisure markets uh, because uh, because they're where the growth is. Um, I think it's a real, really exciting opportunity for us to shape things and not wait for it to be sort of done to us and presented on a plate. And it's probably very much in line with the white paper as well. We've got the mechanisms, we've got the evidence to do that in the north on your behalf. That's David. Um, Rob and then Gary. So I just, just want to, to, to reassure Councillor Hinchcliffe that, that the businesses have continued to invest. We, we've, we've authorised significant sums of money, many millions, in, in, in stations, in depots, Hull Botanic Gardens, one of our, our, our smaller depots is having a significant upgrade to expand capacity. So just in this year, we will continue to invest in all sorts of facilities and staff accommodation. And we'll be working with, 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 with Gary and David in our, in our business plans for, for following years to continue that investment. And as I said earlier, I think one of the biggest investments the North needs to make in, in, in its railway is that rolling stock programme. We've seen what massive differences can be made by bringing brand new trains into the north. We need to continue with that, but do that under, un, under the auspices of, of trying to really be ahead in, in delivering a decarbonisation agenda at the same time as a modernisation agenda for the, for the north that we've already embarked upon. So I'd like to just reassure um, members that that investment is still happening today and we look to do it more in future. Thanks, Rob. Gary? Yeah, I, think I, I was just going to say that it does, it, it, speaking with somebody who managed franchises, I think for coming up for 20 years before um, before COVID came along, the end of the two yeah. franchises, one already happening um, because of Northern's move into operator of last resort, but also the move across to the direct award for TP, it, it changes the most fundamental aspects of how we used to buy our railway services, which is that we effectively entered into a, um, a, a deal that was that was put in a safe that said this is what you'll do over the coming few years and all of the cost and all the revenue risk sits with the operator to do that and if we want to make changes we have to go through a very long and convoluted process of of warming up a financial model again and and and, and that is just 
by the wayside effectively now and, and what we've got instead is an, an annual uh, an annual cycle of planning for the the year ahead for the timetable in the year ahead for the the, the rolling stock that will need to be deployed the new folks who need to be hired um, and and in the one sense that's great news for us because it means that david's quite right at the north gets not much uh, closer and more ongoing say the real unfortunate thing is that what brought that about was is going to be incredibly testing for us in in the financial sphere when we when we see what the uh, see what the, the spending review looks like. So it's 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 without be, being dramatic, it's kind of best of times, worst of times thing. It's the it's the, it's the best gift for for uh, TFN and the Real North Partnership, I think, in terms of in flight change and improvement that we're going to need, um, but against a really really testing background. Okay, thanks for that, Gary. That, that's very useful. Um, I was just going to ask briefly uh, about Boxing Day services. Um, obviously, very pleased that kind of essentially this Boxing Day we'll be seeing a St Helens to Lime Street uh, service operating. I completely appreciate how engineering work is the key determinant for Boxing Day services, but I just think it'd be probably useful uh, for us to, to get some report on what may be in the mix for 2022 and 2023 because engineering. Uh, programs are being set now so we should be able to understand which other parts of the north on future boxing days can also expect an appropriate boxing day service so i don't know gary if you want to answer that um, I, I think if you don't mind i'll take that away liam rather than get it wrong i'll, I'll get uh, an update off i won't need to wait for another uh, committee I'll get, I'll get an update circulated in, in short order on that if that's okay yeah that'd be absolutely fine i think that's something everyone would be okay. very keen to sort of understand Okay, um, if we've, we've dealt with everything on uh, item six, I think there's no further indications of what I wanted to speak. Let's move on to item seven, which is the Manchester Recovery Task Force update. I know David's going to introduce this, but we've also got Richard George joining us. He's also going to say a few words as well. So, David, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I just really wanted to highlight it's very much an update report. It is work in progress. And uh, you had the discussion at the board meeting, some of you back in, in June. Uh, what have we done? We've continued to uh, press uh, a case to get um, uh, a resolution on the service side and progress on the infrastructure side. I'm pleased to say that uh, we've had uh, some good progress on the service side with Hot House session with the task force. The task force are now very proactively engaged with developing the roadmap that you've asked for. We've uh, seen uh, uh, the first version of that and uh, some further work to do on that, uh, but I'm confident that that is progressing in the in the right way. So that's a really good uh, outcome. And that's, that's looking at not only what the infrastructure would provide in terms of we can enhance, uh, restore services, but also other service changes, other bits of infrastructure that aren't necessarily directly related to the Manchester Light Education. Uh, so um, uh, is I think we've had a very positive meeting with DFP member board meeting. Uh, Tim Wood talking to DFP about a much collaboration on infrastructure. We're working much much closely with DFP and also working for the uh, what changing uh, financial treasury. So we've done quite a lot. Economic also being doing with South York, it was specific economic impact in the fuel city. So, I say progress is uh, next bring a report on that and uh, be to give an of the what uh, to I think I come from the and you managed to and uh, that would be the date for the challenge progress. To give the officer on the call now, seeing about what it is. There are no options we, as we I were so involved. Um, intention uh, for the uh, progress are making incomplete, but I think to, to risk who uh, engage but just give a point of view. Thank you, Liam. I think to close to these, there are a number of I've been able to get in the diary, um, and I'm on holiday this week, which doesn't help that process either. Uh, so, Dan, uh, I've been trying to get to see you. We're, I'm in contact with your office. 
Mr. Burnham, I've been trying to get hold of uh, Andy as well. Uh, I think he's disappeared from the call, but whatever. I, I was, we're still trying to fix up various meetings. Um, but the, what I would say is that um, looking at um, the position we we're in in terms of putting the spec together for December 22, it looks awfully like the same problems we faced uh, two or three years ago. We've still got the same choices that we've got to make in many respects in terms of we've got to decide what priorities we put on the Catsfield Corridor. And I'm sorry to keep banging on about the Catsfield Corridor. It sounds like a broken record talking about the Catsfield Corridor, but it is at the heart of, of the specification of how it affects everything else. Um, the one thing I am clear about is that there is no clever timetable fix that's going to give everybody what they want, um, which, do, which does mean that somewhere along the line, we're stuck with having to make uh, uh, some compromises, um, and that's going to be uncomfortable for everybody, not least of which the railway planners, because uh, it's not their job, actually, to decide on those. It's for, it's for the leaders to decide on what those compromises should be. As, as Matthew eloquently put before, uh, the train planner's job is to put together the timetable that serves the community, not, not the other way around. Um, so I haven't got to the end of this process at all. I'm, I'm fearful that there's no easy fixes. Uh, there's no great surprises at the moment, frankly. Uh, and we haven't got a guiding mind to wave a wand and decide for us either. Um, so I'll continue having the discussions. Um, uh, and unfortunately, as I've said many times before, I haven't got uh, a magic wand either. Um, and somehow we will have to decide what that specification looks like and we need to decide that specification pretty soon because there's an awful lot of work the train planners will need to do in order to have a timetable uh, fit for consultation later on this year. So I will continue my rounds of talking to people um, and, um, and we'll get to where we get to. Okay, thanks for that, Richard, and thanks for that very sort of candid uh, update. I think that, that's very, very useful and helpful. Are there any comments or questions anyone wants to raise at, uh, at this stage? Dan? Thank you, Liam. I mean, just to say back to Richard, look, I think you understand the strength of feeling that exists in South Yorkshire about this, specifically around the potential loss of direct connectivity to the airport. I can't think of any other city in the world the size of Sheffield that's had a direct link and then has lost it. So this is a big issue for us. So keen to meet you, the earliest available opportunity to impress upon you the importance of seeking to find a solution. But I accept that there are no quick fixes. But given the impact that this work has right across the north of England, I think it is incredibly important that government gives it the closest possible attention and, and maybe even brings to bear additional resource. If the government want to level up the country, then this is a very good way of demonstrating their commitment to it. So a really important issue. I'm pleased to hear that some progress is being made, but I remain concerned about the, the likely impact that this will have uh, on, on my passengers and my constituents in South Yorkshire. So keen that we work together to find a resolution as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I, I absolutely understand the concerns of South Yorkshire. Uh, I think one of the the stark things about the options from MRTF was that um, for all sorts of reasons and uh, capacity reasons, which I completely and totally understand, um, none of the options included uh, the South Yorkshire to the airport train. Um, and that's, that's a very stark message that comes out of the options, uh, which is why yeah, I, I, I do need to talk to you and yours. Um, it, it, it's, it's a, it is a problem that we need to find a solution to. But it's not an it's not a capacity, um, it's it's not an easy capacity to fix. Put it that way. So we, we need to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for that, Dan and Richard. Any other comments uh, that anyone wants to make at, at this stage, uh, other than obviously uh, we need to make sure that those conversations happen offline with with a number of different people, and crucially, move forward to uh, another meeting uh, at some point in the in the next month. C can I be clear, Liam? Do we do we know do we do we know when that meeting is likely to be? I don't think we've had anything organised as of yet. But David, do you want to to clarify? Yeah, the, the latest. We're, we're doing some diary checks at the moment, and we're, we're looking at targeting it mid uh, mid July, which is would give time to 
um, get in place all the necessary governance pieces before sort of summer holidays, etc. So that is the, the target. I mean, it is all caveated on the progress that we, we make, of course, but that's what we're looking at. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think also before we move on, just sort of thank you, Richard, for, for interrupting your holiday to actually kind of join us today. Genuinely, it's very, very much appreciated. OK, should we move on to our final agenda item then, which is business planning and commissioning? Uh, and I think sort of David and Jim are going to do a bit of a double act here. So, David, you want to go first? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, I'll kick off. Uh, I think just the context of this is, I mean, it is essentially for noting and endorsing the kind of next steps not a, uh, uh, anything like a decision, but we wanted to bring this today because I think in the context of the white paper, it shows the value that uh, both PFN can add and, and working with, with you as uh, local authority partners can bring uh, because essentially we've got a, a very ambitious long-term rail strategy, 20-year plan that everybody uh, agrees is uh, the right level of ambition for the, for the North. And the question is, how do, we, how do we make some progress on some of those uh, very important aspects? And, and the answer is um, we've got the tools, we've got the capacity, we've got the knowledge in the north to do that, and that's exactly what we're doing. Now, we can't deliver everything in that 20-year plan in one go, but this paper highlights the progress we're making in three key areas, the first of which is, is stations. And, uh, you know, we did secure significant investment in the old uh, Northern TP franchising stations, and the operators have, have delivered that. But, you know, we've got 500 stations and um, some big gaps in... Uh, in, in what people see as acceptable standards, be that accessibility or general general quality. So, you know, having delivered that uh, through the operators and franchises, uh, we're not sitting back and saying, what is the next stage now? What is the minimum uh, standards that we aspire to as the first step? And then obviously want to go, go beyond that. So the work we highlight in the report is, is trying to put an analytical spin on that and use our evidence to say, how can we use the uh, uh, analysis and local knowledge to make the best possible case? So what we want to do is achieve more investment and a bigger share of the national pot, quite simply. And we can do that by bringing in local knowledge, bringing in our evidence. And we set out an approach um, where we're looking at perhaps taking clusters of stations to uh, increase the uh, attractiveness of the business case and, uh, uh, and secure more investment. We are suggesting that we do that in, in three ways, and we've looked at accessibility as an example. Um, it does cover every area, but we know accessibility is, is a key area we're falling behind on, and there's still about 40% stations that don't have what would be considered minimum uh, uh, step-free access. Uh, we are going to bring a paper on that to the board uh, in, in July to TFN board, so there'll be more on that there. But we've used that as a bit of case study and said, actually, um, we, can, uh, we can try and secure uh, some investment through the through the DFT's national pipeline, the RNET process, by putting together a really strong case for, for clusters of stations. Secondly, we can work with you directly, local authorities, because stations, after all, are, are, are community assets, and, and you know what's best in your areas. We'll work with you on strengthening the case and evidence base for, for the plans you've got for stations and, and uh, share our methodology on that. And then finally, uh, which is probably the code through the board report, to really argue the case, um, for a, a bigger share of the national pot of that accessibility uh, uh, funding to really make a step change on uh, uh, on that and get to a level of at least minimum accessibility uh, across the across the north because we are quite a long way behind. So we'll set that out in the board report uh, next month and, and work with uh, your uh, lead officers to uh, uh, to develop that methodology. Jim is going to talk about um, two other specifics around journey times and reliability where we've made some really good progress as well. Okay, so firstly with journey times, um, it's perhaps worth just reminding members, how you aren't enough to take a minute or two to do this, Liam, of, of just what journey times in the north of England are like. They basically, in many respects, they're unchanged and unimproved for decades. So Leeds to Bradford, is 30 miles an hour is this the the end-to-end -end speed for a service between Leeds and Bradford it's the same as it was in the early part of the last century also with two station stops over 100 years it hasn't improved actually it was 18 minutes then it's 20 minutes now so it's quicker in the early 1900s than it is today Manchester to Southport is slower than it was in the days of steam trains when I was a kid and this is writ large across the north, all services all over the place, Manchester to Blackburn, lots and lots and lots of them. 
as well as not serving the needs of the North very well, it drives operating cost because you get poor utilisation of resources. Thank you for nodding, Matthew. I'm, I'm pleased to say that. But it's an important point. There is a win-win situation potentially to be achieved. Getting there is it's easier to describe what it would be than to describe how to get there. But a faster service would both meet the need, I mean, or, or, not lots of lines across the north of England, would meet the needs of the north better and help the drive down the operating costs of both franchises because they would be able to make better use of their resources. And we've been doing some work on, on this. So I'll, I'll give the example of the Northumberland line, which is a reopening scheme from Ashington and Blythe into um, Newcastle. The original plan, that's been being worked on for quite a number of years and has very successfully, I mean, it's going forward. The government's funded it, real success in the last 12 months to, to um, achieve its funding approvals and entry into the, the, the pipeline and so on. But the original plans um, involved a slow service in Northumberland would, would have required four train sets and four loads of train crew to operate a train every half an hour. And we, TFN, intervened and said, no, you need to design the infrastructure that you're providing to allow the train sets to get round quickly enough so that you only need three of them to operate a service every half hour. And that is the basis, including adequate turnaround times at the ends to ensure that it's reliable. I think Rob's on the call now. Rob made the point very early on, Rob Warns from Northern, Rob made the point very early on that the, and absolutely rightly, that you would need adequate turnaround times. And we asked Rob what they were, 10 minutes minimum, and that's the basis on which TFN said, right, this must be developed on this basis. And it is being developed on that basis. It's easier when the infrastructure is being upgraded and um, what we're looking at and what TFN is looking at is a program to address that on all lines across the north. So um, again, that's easier said than done, but the principle is an important one. I think the delivery plan that's being worked up for this will set out a process for rolling it out across the north of England. Now, it won't be possible. There'll be different potential benefits on different on different lines. Your horses for courses thing. It won't be possible to produce reductions in operating the cost on all lines, probably not even on the majority. But even if you did it only on a third of them or a quarter of them, that could be significant. On other lines, particularly um, lines where the service terminates and goes back again, but with short turnaround times, Bishop Auckland, Gloucester and Adfield, Blackpool South, Colne, there's quite a lot of them. If you could speed the trains up so they get to the destination earlier and then can leave later, they have a greater amount of turnaround time, they have more resilience. If they arrive late, they've got a much better chance of departing back on time, and that will be the purpose. So with that in mind, we're, the delivery plan has been drawn up, and we one of the other difficulties of this is, was, frankly, the, the, the a process for identifying the works necessary um, wasn't um, wasn't fit for purpose, basically. And I, in, in, I want to give credit to Network Rail. That sounds like it's criticism of Network Rail. I want to give credit to them. They have been very open in being willing to develop a new process about this. And we have TFN as spearheaded in conjunction with Network Rail and with good collaboration from TPE and from Northern, a new process that has gained rail industry recognition. It's been piloted now on five lines, and the, it's identified that it's a couple of minutes journey time improvement uh, that could be achieved between York and Scarborough, basically with the existing infrastructure doesn't need investment, needs a tiny amount of expenditure, things like changing the speed boards and just check, re, rechecking the uh, level crossing assessments. Similarly, between Darlington and Bishop Auckland, there are about four-minute journey time improvement there, and that should achieve a reliability improvement on that service. There are three other lines as well that are in the, the pilot scheme. Um, and as I say, we've had very good industry collaboration We've now submitted a bid to the Rail Network Enhancements Pipeline for funding. Um, well, we submitted it for one and a half million, but the provisional allocation has been for half a million for assessing 
which would allow us to assess about a third of the remaining lines across the north of England. Again, to look at what the existing infrastructure is capable of. And you might wonder, how, how does that come about? How does the existing infrastructure turn out to be capable of better speed? Frankly, it's a result of the, the renewals program that Network Rail has had over the last 10 years. But Network Rail is not, I can see Martin nodding to that, but it, that, it, that's the secret of it. And what TFN has done is spotted that there is an opportunity there to maximise the use of that renewals program because at the moment, network rail is not, uh, it has no responsibility for raising the speed. It just has a responsibility for doing the renewal, not for spotting what journey time opportunity might be uh, achievable as a result of it. Now, as I say, that's not meant in any way as criticism of network rail. They, they could take their instructions from the Office of uh, Road and Rail, and that is their instruction. But they have been very open, and I want to stress this point, praising the collaboration we've had from Network Rail about this in developing the new process and being willing to, to change how they do it, look for these opportunities. At the first instance, they're being rolled out York, Scarborough, and Darlington to Bishop Portland. But the other three lines are Manchester to Clitheroe, Leeds, Bradford, Preston, um, and uh, sorry, Doncaster to uh, Doncaster, Scunthorpe. Grimsby, Cleethorpes. But the, the programme that we bid for is for um, assessing a further 22 lines across the north of England. If I can move on to reliability schemes, these are small scale interventions that we are looking at. Um, perhaps just worth saying, there are already a very clearly defined set of responsibilities about um, performance. The train operators have their responsibilities. They, those are overseen, as you know, through uh, the Rail North Partnership. Network Rail have a set of responsibilities, and they're about trains and drivers and, and operating things uh, in, in the right way. Network Rail has a set of responsibilities about reliability, and that is essentially about maintaining the infrastructure, making sure rails don't break, signals don't fail, drains don't block up, embankments don't fall down, all that sort of stuff. And that is overseen by the Office of Road and Rail. But there is a, there is a set of, of stuff in the middle that, that up to now has dropped down the crack between that, for whom nobody is responsible, which is identifying where investment in the infrastructure might enable better reliability. Now, we've appointed a, an officer who's doing working out the delivery plan for that. Um, he has been in intensive discussions with Network Rail and Northern and TPE. In fact, the list of schemes we've got uh, has come from the train operator, primarily from the train operators, but also secondarily from Network Rail. Um, there is a, we've, we've got about 130 proposals, which shows you the scope for this stuff. Um, but we've, we've identified 11 um, that look like potential quick wins. They're all relatively, the, the ones that we've identified as uh, quick wins are relatively small scale, should be fairly cheap, fairly cheerful, fairly quick to implement. They are things like a, a level crossing upgrades to allow the trains to run faster over them, provision of some what are called intermediate block signals to, to allow trains to proceed more quickly after other ones, one in Cumbria, one in the Wharf Valley, um, one on the Mid-Cheshire line, I think, and those, those three were identified by Northern. Um, they are fairly small-scale things like that. We are, they are being worked up and they'll be set out in the delivery plan. I'm hoping that, that both of these delivery plans need some further work on them to, to finalise them. They will set out overall how we're going to take this forward. I would hope they will be in a position to bring to you in a month or two. I believe it at that. Sorry, I've, I've taken a little time on that. I've taken advantage, Liam, of the fact that we got the meeting was running to time. But I hope that's uh, useful and interesting, and I will very happily answer any questions anyone might have. No, it, it certainly is, Jim. And you know, look, I'd like to take the opportunity just to sort of praise you and everyone that's been involved, particularly with the line speeds. Um, improvement work because that really is industry leading stuff that is well, there's no quick wins in the railway um, unfortunately but is some of the in theory easier stuff because it's about kind of looking at how the asset can work and maximizing its its potential really so some excellent stuff there 
Um, before I bring a number of people in for, for questions and comments, just solely so I don't forget, uh, Caroline has put a question in the, the chat um, that pertains to the previous uh, Manchester Recovery Task Force uh, item that Andy wanted to raise, but he had to, to leave, and it deals with kind of the potential of a calling service for Goldburn and that being, um, being dependent upon some electrification to Staley Bridge. Rather than kind of reopen the debate and discussion we've just had, can I ask David to pick that up offline and liaise with Caroline and Andy as a, a sort of specific answer to that, yeah. uh, to that question? I think, I think it's um, quite a specific question, so yeah, that's no problem. We'll get enough. Wonderful. And, and obviously we can uh, appropriately kind of recognise that in the, the minutes of, of this meeting uh, accordingly. Um, but I've got Melissa indicating then Susan. So Melissa, do you want to, to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, unfortunately, um, Mayor Jarvis had to leave, um, so just on his behalf. Um, Jim, can you just clarify the same? My understanding is the line speed improvement desktop study has also been done on the Hope Valley line, and that it's already looking like initial good results for potential um, improvements there. Can you confirm was progress subsequently made to take this now to the next stage? I believe that TFN last week were looking to commission the next stage, which I understand is then the validation stage, which then goes to implementation stage. Can you confirm if that was progressed and what that could mean shortly for the Hope Valley? Uh, yes, I can confirm that's right. The, the, the um, new process was applied to the Hope Valley and identified the scope for the existing infrastructure to allow up to four minutes better, particularly for the TPE trains that are subject to a, what's called a differential speed limit at the moment. Um, and yes, your second point, that TFN is is intending to commission uh, Network Rail actually just to, to validate that. So I probably need to explain to members what the validation is. The initial assessment is based on Network Rail's records. And whereas you might think we would be entitled to expect those to be completely accurate, in some respects, they then have to go back and check that what's on the ground does actually uh, correspond with what their, their uh, records back in the office say, so you have to pay them to do that. So yes, that work is being commissioned. Uh, it shouldn't take all that long. It should be um, report back by the autumn, I would hope, uh, and it will then um, hopefully confirm how much of this potential journey time improvement might actually be realisable fairly quickly. But I don't want to say more specifically than that because we haven't had those discussions with Network Rail yet about what timescale they might agree to with the record. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? Thank you. Um, yeah, I just echo what you said, Liam, about uh, the work there that's been done and obviously particularly recognise uh, that would be fantastic if we could prove that 30 miles an hour speed limit, um, which is shocking to it really, when we hear that things were better 100 years ago. It really is shocking and, and it gives us all motivation to keep going on what our ambitions are for our respective areas on the north. Um, um, obviously, welcome that Leeds Bradford Preston uh, speed improvement work that you're doing there. Uh, it'd be good to have a list of all those. This is 13 locations. I couldn't see the list of those. Uh, and um, obviously, there's a number of stations listed in the document, but it'd be good to see where those are across the north um, so that we can all sort of pile in behind those when we need to. I think also it talks about economic case, etc. but it does focus, I mean, and this is what I've gone as the stations element of it, really, not the line speed stuff, um, but it may well be relevant for that as well talks about um, economic case, but I just wonder, are we taking our own medicine with this? Because the economic case, of course, should think about regeneration benefits of what we're doing here and not just line speeds, journey times, etc. So we, I just want to make sure that economic case for investment on stations and line speeds is taking a broader economic view of what transport can do for an area and not just doing what is historically being done, which is just talk about speed and journey time. In general terms, um, y yes, we the, we we do um, include the work of TFN's team 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 and the work they do on the uh, analysis of the wider economic benefits. It's one of the strengths of us being part of TFN is to to have that to to draw on. 
we will be feeding that in at the appropriate moments into the journey time improvement um, schemes when we come to bid for funding for them for all the reasons that you absolutely rightly set out you know it, it's an important element and it helps strengthen the business case um, with the particular um, reliability improvements potentially some of those are so so small scale it might be where appropriate we will try and point to the wider economic benefits from them but um, it, yeah wherever appropriate and wherever we can actually quantify a benefit from them but some of them are actually so very cheap and cheerful that hopefully they might just have a, a, a much more straightforward and, and simple business case with with, with the stations uh, one there's more potential i think and, and that's exactly where we'll uh, work with with local authorities as say recognizing that stations are a part of the the, the local area um, uh, and, and I think that's what we're saying. We can we can combine that with our evidence and, and probably clustering some of these together to make the strongest possible case to get more 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 of the national uh, more share of the national funding pot. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I was going to follow up uh, on some of those points about stations that, that Susan's made as well, because I think one of the things I'm very conscious of is that kind of a lot of railway stations across the north of England are underutilised assets. They're not only just gateways to communities, but quite often um, as part of the estate, the physical buildings can be underutilised. And actually, there's a lot you could do <laughs> to kind of use a lot of what were um, what are basically redundant buildings as kind of incubators for small businesses on a peppercorn rent. And actually kind of anything we can do within the station strategy that kind of um, yeah, pushes that agenda forward would be, be great. But I think one of the other aspects I really wanted to raise is about the issue of accessibility in terms of how we're doing the, the station strategy. And I'm delighted that we are because when you look at the appendices, you know, Appendix A, which lists um, stations in the north that the government is funding uh, to make them step free um, in this control period, so up until 2024, um, actually, of the 15 listed, two are in North Wales and three are entirely on the Mersey Rail network. So actually, the fact that the government's only funding 10 stations across the whole of the north of England for the next few years to make them properly accessible, something's gone badly wrong there, that the north of England is missing out on the, the level of investment that we, we need. But I would sort of say that in the station strategy that we're pulling together, we need to be quite visionary about what is the programme to get all of our stations fully accessible in a suitable time scale. You know, we are dealing with the sort of legacy of, of Victorian infrastructure here. I think one of the things we also need to react to that I'm sure other members will have been getting lots of emails about is uh, the quite sort of correct and sort of strong campaign that guide dogs are putting forward about um, tactile paving on platforms as a basic safety requirement. That you know, is something that we've got to reflect on how all of the north stations are going to be dealt with um, uh, accordingly but one of the other aspects i think we need to be thinking about in that station strategy is yes by all means we have to get every station fully accessible but we also need to make sure that actually in the fullness of time we focus on making sure that it's fully accessible to get from the train uh, the platform to the train you know what is our plan for level boarding in the fullness of time i say that because we do have a direct answer here in the Liverpool City region because our, the new trains for Mersey Rail will have level boarding from the platform onto the train. I know how difficult the engineering solution can be to, to all of this, but at this moment in time, the rest of the wider rail industry, not just across the north, but beyond, it's seen as being in much too, uh, much too much of the too difficult box. And unless we start thinking about what the vision is over the coming years and decades, Quite frankly, it's unacceptable. I think that in perpetuity, someone with accessibility issues is dependent upon a ramp being put down to down for them. When, in the fullness of time, there is a proper engineering solution that can treat everybody equally. So, for me, I'm delighted we're doing that station strategy. I just hope it's uh, really visionary and includes all of those kind of aspects in terms of our kind of forward view. Yeah, Liam, if I could respond, just I think yeah, that would really, be really, yeah, absolutely. We want to we want to uh, set out a vision for the north. I think it's another advantage of working collaboratively across the north. There's loads of great work being done on stations um, in in individual locations. I could reel them off, you know, from Maryport in Cumbria, um, recent work at Castleford, Redcar, doing some great work about integrating with the town. You, know, you, you could go on and on, but 
out of 500 stations, that's still only quite a small small list, and it only tends to tackle certain elements. So what we want to do is share that best practice uh, right across the, the north. And I think uh, when you actually start to look at it across the north, it makes a strong case, um, as you've said, for that uh, national investment, because uh, it's just bigger numbers. And people travel right across the north. People don't just travel in one particular local authority area. Uh, I think it also allows us to share the best practice developed perhaps in some of the uh, uh, the combined authority areas with the more rural areas as well, uh, and perhaps best practice in different things. Some of the rural areas have done some good stuff uh, in their own way, uh, but we can we can share that around. So I think that's that's part of the uh, the plan here really, and the level boarding in in Mersey uh, on Mersey Rail is uh, is a good example of that. How can we apply that uh, in other parts of the of the north? Maybe not everywhere, but. Uh, there might be some routes that we can see would be appropriate. So I think that's the plan. Um, the accessibility piece, if they will set out in more detail, the ambition around that. Um, and uh, I think you're right to highlight that whilst step-free access is important to everyone, actually not just people with reduced mobility, um, there's an awful lot of other uh, improvements that improve access ability uh, for people with all sorts of other difficulties. Um, and, uh, and, and that's important that we tackle those as well and look at, uh, look at those which might not be sort of uh, perhaps as eye-catching as some of the big uh, uh, investments, but I think it's important that we have a, a comprehensive plan and strategy for tackling that. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks for that, David. I'm not seeing any other uh, indications to, to speak, so I think that kind of brings us to the end of this uh, item accordingly. And actually, that's the kind of uh, the end of all of our agenda for items for um, this afternoon's meeting. So. With all of that, I can thank you all for, uh, for attending. I hope all remain safe and well uh, with you, and we look forward to, to seeing you at our next meeting, be that virtual or hopefully uh, very soon uh, we can all meet uh, together in person. So uh, I know David will be in touch with, with future dates uh, and arrangements accordingly. So thanks very much. I'll close the meeting and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.